Good morning. Welcome to worship on this Labor Day weekend. Uh, there are some advantages to recording a service and putting it online. I'm sure many of you are watching from your campsites, and uh, I'm sure there's somebody in Big Timber, Montana, that's watching the service today. And and I think even Mary's, hopefully Mary's sister in Kansas is is joining us. So good morning if you are. I have started here in the Eagles Wing because of Pilgrim Club, which is in session today. I'm, I'm recording on Friday morning. And so if maybe you've heard of Pilgrim Club, maybe you haven't, but um, it's an effort for us to be of service to our community. Um, we're inviting kids to come for the day to do their online school and uh, to be here in a safe, safe environment while their parents are at work or, or need a place for their kids to be. So we're offering that service and, and some families are taking advantage of that. So at least to begin this morning, I'm, I'm ensconced, as I said, in the Eagle's Wing. We'll begin our worship today with our confession and, and hearing the proclamation um, that our sins are forgiven. So please join me as we pray together. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. And trusting in the mercy of God, we join together to confess our sin and also the sins of the whole world. Let us pray. Reconciling God, we confess that we have not trusted in your abundance and are unable to see your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We don't trust that you provide enough for all. We abuse your great creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live with you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the prodigal abundance of God's mercy, we have peace through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us now live in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, be with you all. So I invite you, wherever you are, to take a moment and share God's peace with one another. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord God, enliven and preserve your church with your perpetual mercy. Without your help, we mortals will fail. Remove far from us everything that is harmful and lead us toward all that gives life and salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today's psalm lesson is from the 119th Psalm. 
Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding, so that I may keep your law, and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes, and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant, so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. <clears throat> How I long for your precepts, in your righteousness preserve my life. Good morning. I've been asked to do the children's time this week. And after reading through all of the different lessons, the one that really touched me was the psalm lesson from Psalm 119. Let me read a few verses to you and my ideas of what my perception is of each one. The first one is, Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end. Think about this verse. It's so easy to veer off the path. Every day we have choices. The next one is, give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Did you know that the laws that we have are to protect us? We have stop signs, we have traffic lights, warning labels. I bet you can think of many others. The next verse says, direct me in the path of your commands. For there I find delight. Can you think of times when you did something special for someone, and after you did it, how good it made you feel? The next verse is, Turn my heart toward your statutes, and not toward selfish gain. This one reminds me of a time when I was driving and I was in such a hurry and I decided to pass someone that was in the left lane going slowly and I went around them in the right lane and you know what happened? I missed the turn off and I had to go all the way to the next road to come back to where I was. The next verse says, Turn my eyes away from worthless things and preserve my life according to your word. During this time of pause, I have spent a lot of time in my garage and shed, and I've discovered that I saved a lot of stuff that I thought I might need. You know what? I ask myself, why do I need these things? So there are other verses but let me say that we will be reading verses like these as we start the program of reading through the Bible. Think about each one of these as we go through the month of September, and let us be mindful of others and spend some time thinking about what we can do to live the way Jesus wants us to live. Thank you and have a good week. The first lesson is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die. And you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways. That wicked person will die for their sin and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though you yourself will be saved. Son of man, say to the Israelites, This is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn away from their ways and live. Turn! Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? Word of God, word of life. The second lesson is from the book of Romans, chapter 13. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. 
for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Word of God, Word of Life. Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As we hear those words, grace and peace from God, as we receive them, what do you think is the connection between our receiving these, these things, grace and peace, and our in turn extending them to others? And more than that, if we refuse to extend grace and peace to others, do we receive it ourselves? Some things to, some things to think about. Thomas Paine in 1776 and during the American Revolution wrote, these are the times that try men's souls. And if I may borrow his words for today, these again are trying times. With the current unrest in many of our cities, the cry from both sides, and I would say it's, it's probably safe despite some variations that it's safe to say we are divided along, uh, according to two sides. The cry from both sides is for justice. But what each side means by justice is very different. One side is calling for, for safety and peace and law and order, while the other side cries out for equality and equity. Now, would you agree that there are, there are in fact, valid concerns on each side with respect to justice and where justice is lacking? But neither side seems interested in the valid concerns of the other side. There doesn't seem to be any interest in conversation and working together for a solution beneficial to our shared life and community. And now these opposing sides are confronting each other 
with guns and with violence, inserting these into an already volatile mix. For example, a week or so ago, as the Patriot Prayer vehicles drove through Portland and, and guys were sitting in the back of truck beds and, and they were using paintball guns on protesters, the protesters were responding by throwing objects back at these vehicles and, and their occupants. And that's to say nothing of the actual, actual guns that some in both groups were carrying. Now this is not heading in a good direction, nor will it end up in a good place. Events in, in Portland and in Kenosha, Wisconsin are evidence that this is true. Do we really want the streets of our cities to become war zones? Today this seems alarmingly possible. Again, both sides are calling for justice, but justice is not being served. Now Christians, we Christians, we can and we do have something to say about justice. And our source book, the source book for our faith and our life together, the Bible, it instructs us in the ways of justice. Take today's readings as examples of this. Jesus says, if your brother or your sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. If they refuse to listen, however, you are to take one or two with you and, and try again. And if that still doesn't work, take the whole church with you and try for it a third time. Try to win them back is what Jesus is saying. Now Jesus' instruction for resolving conflict, it doesn't take place in a vacuum. Jesus is telling us how to resolve disputes because there are and there will continue to be disputes that need resolving. The goal is reconciliation and restoration of community. The goal is justice. Now Jesus' teaching, however, is, is not to be used like an instruction manual. Maybe you remember the saying that Bible refers to the basic instruction before leaving earth. Rather than that, rather than laying out a step-by-step -step process that guarantees success if we follow it to, a, to the letter, instead I invite you to think about the Bible and, and our instruction from Jesus that we hear today from him is the desire and the extraordinary efforts that Jesus describes to bring someone back into community. And to support, to support that, that view of, of this reading, right before this, earlier in chapter 18, Jesus tells us the parable of the 99 sheep who are safely ensconced in the sheep, sheepfold and the one who has gotten lost, the one who is out there and away from this community. And couldn't this one lost sheep be this same guy in our reading today who has sinned and who we are trying to be reconciled with. And notice the activity that Jesus wants from us. He says, go and talk to the person. And if that doesn't work, try again and take one or two others with you. Go and speak to him or to her, appealing to a desire for healing and for reconciliation. And if that still doesn't work a second time, then get the whole community into the act, seeking to redeem the one who has gone astray. There is an extraordinary amount of effort expended in trying to bring this person back into the community. And to drive that point home, right after our reading today, Jesus tells Peter to be willing to forgive someone 77 times. Jesus places a high premium and a high priority on healing and, and reconciliation and restoration. At the end of our, our reading today, Jesus says, if two of you agree, if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Is it possible, even probable, that the two or three gathered in Jesus' name includes the one who had sinned, who was estranged, but who is now reconciled and redeemed into the community? Does the two or three gathered in my name include the one who had sinned, but who is now restored into the fellowship? Jesus is saying, I am there with you wherever there is healing and reconciliation. 
And Jesus promises that when we are about this work of reconciliation, when we come together as a community to address our differences, to resolve our disputes, to seek to end conflict, and repair relationships. Jesus promises he is there. And isn't that the point of our sharing the peace in our worship, especially how we do it right after the confession and hearing the proclamation of God's forgiveness? Isn't that the point of why we share the peace? So what if we were to strive less for righteousness and more for humility? recognizing that, that we are more likely to find Jesus amid acts of humility than acts of self-righteousness? What if we were to become agents of reconciliation rather than dispensers of righteousness? What if we were to seek conversation and to be a place of welcome and forgiveness? If this is true for the church, could it also be true for the larger community? I believe that God was present in the healing and the reconciliation of, that took place in South Africa after apartheid, and also in the, the healing in Rwanda after the terrible genocide there. And if God can work the miracle of reconciliation in those horrific circumstances, couldn't God do the same with us? Before we can ask these questions of our larger community, though, we need to ask them of ourselves. We need to ask them of the church gathered in Jesus' name, us. Do we treat others in ways that divide and build walls or in ways that tear them down? Do we go to a person to talk with them or do we talk about them behind their back? Are we more eager to listen to or to judge those who differ from us? Think again about our sharing the peace in our worship and what that seeks to accomplish. Reading in the Wall Street Journal Friday, uh, a couple of authors wrote an opinion piece and they said they were talking about our tendency to divide the world between us and them. And they said this has come even to this divide, this us and them has come even to American churches where righteous advocacy of social justice can come across as self-righteous scolding of individuals. Christians have a religious duty, they say, to champion the cause of justice. But as the prophet Micah teaches us, they also have the duty to walk humbly with God and with their neighbors. Ultimately, they say, everyone bears responsibility for this divide that is between us. The authors say recognizing our own participation is key. As long as the cause of the problem is someone else, then nothing can be done. But those who acknowledge how they contribute to the problem also can begin to imagine how they can create a better culture. This is true for individuals. It's true for the church as a whole. This is true for me. Again, as Christians, we can and we do have something to say about justice. And the Bible, our scriptures, instructs us in the ways of justice. Another example is our reading in Romans 13 today, where Paul says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. He says the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commands there may be. These are all summed up in this one command, to love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And not only does love fulfill the law, it also makes for justice in our communities, within the church, where it is sorely needed and in places like Kenosha, Wisconsin, and Portland, Oregon, where it is needed just as badly. But as we look around and given events within the church and also in our communities, we seem unwilling and we seem unable to love one another and to find justice. The first step that we need to take, the first step towards solving this problem is to recognize our need for humility. And then, 
as we have a humble heart to turn toward God and to learn God's ways. As our psalm today says, Teach me, Lord, the ways of your decrees. Give me understanding. Direct me in the path of your commands. Turn my heart, turn my eyes away from worthless things. That is, bend me toward justice. God's ways are healing and reconciliation that lead us to justice and to peace with one another in community. In closing, Martin Luther believed that God's justice, the way justice looks in God, is God's divine surrender, God's giving of God's self to us, for us. And this is demonstrated. We see what this looks like. We see that this is true in Jesus Christ and through his cross. And this is the center for us. And this is the center out of which comes our grace and our peace. This is also the center for us as a community that God is creating in Jesus Christ. Romans and Psalm 119 are about learning how to live in the ways of justice. And Jesus gives us instruction on how to heal and how to reconcile and how to break down dividing walls. It begins in humility and with a willingness to go and talk with the other person. And not just to talk to them, but also to listen to them. Amen. Continue with the prayers of the church, so uh, please join me as we pray together. Lord God of creation, you breathe life into us all. We breathe in what the trees breathe out, and the trees breathe in what we breathe out. You who breathe into us the wisdom to shape our breath into words, to shape our words so that they aim toward justice. May the words we pray today speak deeply to the needs of our nation and the world. Help us all to know that the sharing of our breath with all of life is the very proof that we are one. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray that we would be able to stay strong in faith and to live justly in our communities and to trust in Jesus Christ and the victory of the Lamb no matter what the powers and principalities of the world promise us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, on this Labor Day, we thank you for the blessing of work. We ask for strength to complete each day. We ask for rest when we are weary. We ask your guidance for everyone seeking employment. And we ask that you would be with those who face, whose faces we might never see but who work tire, tirelessly each day for the good of us all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for the unique gifts of every child as they begin a new school year. In all that is new and different this year, fill each student with fresh enthusiasm and a heart that is excited to learn and grow. Cover them with your enduring love. Give them confidence and grace and equip them with the ability to persevere through trials. Bless their teachers with wisdom, understanding, and a heart to serve as they embark on this journey together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our president, for Congress, 
and all who are in positions of authority and power in our cities, in our towns, in our states, and in our nation, that they will use their authority to care for our people, especially those seeking justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With our hope in Christ's resurrection, let us pray for those who are sick, grieving, hurting, or anxious. And in the silence that follows, I invite you to offer your own petitions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With one voice, we offer our prayers in the name of the one through whom we have received your grace and peace, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Continuing with our service of Holy Communion, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Pour out again today your Spirit on us and all the world. Unite into one body, people of every nation and tongue, for your kingdom work of renewal and restoration. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread he gave thanks and broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus calls us and sends us out. And so come to this table. And to this meal, receive nourishment for the journey. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Receive the blessing. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and of life and of justice. Amen.
Thanks be to God.